It's a mighty move of God, and it's gonna change my day. Signs and wonder, miracles to perform. It's a mighty move of God, gonna change your day. With signs and wonder, miracles to perform. God's gonna bless you, with just closing on. Come on, choir. It's a mighty move of God, gonna change. Put those hands together. Come on and put those. 
direction that a move of God is on the way. To God be the glory for the great, wonderful, and marvelous things that he has done and he continues to do. He never ceases to amaze me. He is a wonderful God. I do count it a privilege and an honor to be here and stand behind this sacred desk on such an awesome, awesome celebration. I want to give honor to God and to the angel of this house in the presence of the Reverend Dr. Jesse Young who thought it not robbery to allow me to stand here today. And I tell people everywhere I go, you ought to take time out and celebrate your leader. There's all kinds of things in the pulpit, but what God has blessed you with an anointed man of God, you ought to give God some praise. I do honor the co my co-laborers in the vineyard who thought it not robbery to be here on this morning. There is a word from the Lord. And if you have your Bibles, go with me to the Gospel of Luke and the 24th chapter beginning at the first verse. And when you have found it, you may indicate that by saying amen. And if you haven't, just say, hold up. I will be reading from the King James translation of the Bible. And the word of God reads, now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulchre and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Hide me behind the cross and speak through these clay lips of mine. And if anybody asks me who did it, I'll be careful to tell them that Jesus did it. If I were to use as a subtopic on this resurrection morning, it would be empty promises. Look to the person next to you and say empty promises. <laughs> In our world, we are taught that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So many of us have been taken in by empty promises. Uh, that, that we are leery of anything or anyone that tells us we can have something for nothing. The truth of the matter is that the world is full of empty promises. We watch TV and the advertisements tell us that we can be happy, sexy, rich, or famous if we only purchase a certain product. Uh, ever been gypped by an empty promise? Uh, if you use this cream, you won't have any more wrinkles. Uh, he promised to love me uh, and never leave me. And she promised to keep the house clean and cook dinner every day. Promises, promises, promises. But it doesn't take long before we have been fooled to enough to know 
that the world's promises are full of emptiness. But how many of you know uh, uh, that what God does, God never makes a promise that's not too good to be true. God is different. Instead of promises full of emptiness, he gives us emptiness that is full of promise. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to take a look at a very familiar text and a very familiar story, and we're going to find uh, some promises. I'm going to give you three promises. We're going to have breakfast, the play, and morning service, and I'll be gone. Uh, there are three of them. Um, let's look at the text. Uh, look, Luke closes with three scenes of resurrection and vindication, and here we see the first scene. Uh, let's go back, if we can, to that first resurrection morning. It is early morning, dawn, and the sun has not risen. A few of Jesus' followers, women, somebody say they were girls, uh, are on their way to a tomb. Uh, it, it, it is the tomb where Jesus was buried. Uh, they have been walking, can't you imagine them walking uh, and having a conversation that was pretty subdued and grim. Uh, the task was before them and it was a sad one. They are going to anoint the body of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And as they come to the top, uh, can you see them at the rise of the past? They, they stop and motionless and quiet. They stare off in a distance. And, and, and as you can look with them, with your sanctified imagination, you can look over to the right and just outside the city stands a gruesome reminder of the events that took place a few days ago. I'm painting y'all a picture. Can't you see them uh, over there, uh, silhouette by the glow uh, of, the, of the sky? Uh, on the top of the hill, uh, the locals call it the skull or Golgotha. You see three crosses. Yesterday was the Sabbath, so nobody had, had gone and cleaned up and removed anything. So there they stand, empty, reminding you of the horror of Friday. Uh, but the one in the middle is the one that I want you to focus on. That's the one that Jesus hung on. If you take a close look at it, look at the top uh, and see some blood stains. They're from the crown of the thorns that was crushed at Jesus' skull. The, the stains on the ends of the crossbow. They came from the nails that were driven in his hands. Uh, the main beam was, uh, beam was soaked in blood, blood from his back, blood that was bled when the Roman soldiers beat him with a cat of nailed uh, uh, tails. It also had stains from blood that pure, poured from his side when another Roman soldier ran a spear through his side to see if he was dead. You know, you, you've ever seen those stories when, when a gangster and a gunman shot shoot you and the man is laying there dead but just to make sure he was dead he'd shoot him again and so the Roman soldier wanted to make sure that they killed Jesus so they stabbed him again there was no question that Jesus was dead uh, the soldiers knew it the Romans knew it the Jews knew it yes Jesus was really dead uh, but when you look up there at that scene the first thing you see is an empty cross tell somebody an empty cross <laughs> Uh, the cross was empty because Jesus was no longer there. Uh, it was the place that he died, but today it's empty. Empty of Jesus' body, but full of God's promises, full of hope for you and me. Uh, the empty promise of the cross makes us know and understand and celebrate today that I stand forgiven. Uh, because it was on the cross that Jesus paid for the penalty of my sin. Sin, sin. Now that is a word that's not too popular anymore. It's a word that isn't politically correct. But the simple fact of the matter is that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us, you, me, the person sitting next to you, the person sitting behind you, the person sitting in front of you, from the pulpit to the door, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners saved by grace. We have all done some things that God told us not to do, walked in some places that God has told us not to go. And the only person who has ever lived a sinless life is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Everybody else has failed. So here is the problem, y'all. According to God's law, the wages of sin is death. And he said, the soul that sins will surely die. Tell somebody, surely die. 
Because we have sinned, we deserve God's just punishment. We deserve eternal death, hell. However, when you look at the empty cross, it is a reminder of God's promise that we have been forgiven. It's a reminder that though my sins be a scarlet, he'll wash them white as snow. Because it was on the cross that Jesus paid the penalty of our sins. God's word tells us again that God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When I was shucking and jiving, Jesus died for me. It was on that cross that Jesus Christ offered his perfect, sinless life on behalf of each one of us. No one else could do it, not Moses, Abraham, David, or Isaiah, or Muhammad, or Buddha. No one else had ever lived perfectly and then offered his perfect life for our salvation. That is why the Bible tells us that there is no other name given unto heaven by which we can be saved. So when Jesus prayed his last breath, he cried, it is finished. The penalty was paid. On that cross, the empty cross, it was there that his blood was spilt out for my salvation. Before that fateful Friday, God could open the books and look at each one of our names written in black where the words behind our name was guilty of sin. But when Jesus went to the cross, God literally transferred our accounts to his name. And on that day, across every name now he wrote in Jesus' blood. Gwen, in Jesus' blood. Jesse, in Jesus' blood. And behind Jesus' blood was forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. Because of the work that Jesus did on the cross, you and I stand forgiven. The first empty promise is the resurrection of the empty cross filled with the promise of forgiveness. The empty cross tells me that I can be forgiven of all of my sins. The empty cross tells me that I don't have to go to new members class. I don't have to join the usher board. All I got to do is confess with my mouth and believe in my heart. I know when I look at the crosses that they have in the hospital, they made a big mistake. They still got Jesus on the cross. But there is an empty cross on Golgotha because and that gives me to know that my sins are forgiven. So I tell somebody today, you tell the devil that you can't hold it against me. All the stuff that I used to do, yes, I a whoremonger. Yes, I was a thief. Yes, I was a drug dealer. But thank God the cross is empty and Jesus dropped the charges. And I don't have to carry it anymore. An empty cross. Y'all gonna make me preach early in the morning. An empty cross. But let's go back to the text. An empty cross. Let's go back to the text with the sisters. Uh, tell somebody they're the sisters. <laughs> After pausing briefly to look over and see the cross, they, they continued uh, on their way down the path to the tomb. And as they go, one of them wonders, uh, who going to roll the stone away? You know, uh, we got our clothes on and, 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 and we got stilettos and, and we, we can't move the stone. Who going to move? The stone, they, they had good reason, y'all, to be concerned because the stone was placed in front of the tomb uh, was a large boulder, probably weighing upwards to two tons. Not only that, the Romans had sealed it to make sure that, that Jesus wasn't gonna get out of it. We got you, and you ain't going nowhere. Uh, so, so, so no one was allowed to move it without their permission. However, uh, the ladies continued. Y'all need to put a pin in that. Uh, even though they saw the stone, <laughs> They weren't dressed to move the stone. Uh, they didn't have the strength to move the stone, uh, but there was something behind the stone that they needed, so they kept on walking towards the stone. Uh, I, I come to tell somebody this morning, don't be afraid of the stones that's in your path. Uh, just keep on walking, uh, and I guarantee you, like the songwriter said, King Jesus uh, will roll the stone away. They didn't know how the stone was going to be moved, but they knew I'm on my 
valley to see Jesus uh, and something gonna happen uh, before I get there. If you're, uh, and Matthew says that suddenly, how somebody say suddenly. suddenly. I don't know about you, but I've had some moments in my life uh, where I didn't know how the stone was gonna be moved, uh, but suddenly, <laughs> They began to feel the earth moved. Hey, what in the world? I, I believe that happened to us last year. Suddenly, the earth started to shake. Every now and then, God will show up. Suddenly, you don't know how he's going to show up, where he is, but you'll feel something move. The Bible says that the earth moved, even though they were frightened and they looked at each other and not certain of what to do. But as they approached the burial site, they're still wondering about what had happened uh, when they came upon something even more remarkable. Uh, the, the, the Bible says that the soldiers lay as dead men, but the stone was gone. And, and an angel glowing like lightning is sitting on it. Ain't that something? Uh, the, the very thing that you think uh, that, that is going to be in your way, God will move it and you can sit and cross your legs on that thing. Uh, the Bible said they were sitting on it. And, and listen to his word. Don't be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified but he's not here he has risen so why are you looking for the living among the dead put another pin right there y'all are looking for life in the midst of dead stuff <laughs> y'all y'all still going back to dead situations trying to find life in it and you can never find life in dead stuff don't look for the living among the dead if they walked away from you don't go back that's dead if you lose that job don't go back with a lawyer that's dead stop looking for the living stuff among the dead Jesus has risen he was alive and the tomb was empty. <laughs> uh, the second promise of empty promises is an empty tomb. Tell somebody, empty tomb. empty tomb. For in the fact of the empty tomb is the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the promise to every one of us that we too will be raised to eternal life. Uh, to those who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, death has lost its thing. It is no longer something to be feared. What fear is there when we have the promise that one day we're going to live forever with him in heaven? Now, I remind you of a little story of a, a father and a son that was traveling down the, the country road, uh, and, and the little boy was afraid of bees, and he was deathly allergic to a bee sting, uh, and, and the the horror of the bee made the boy so frightened and the closer that they got that the bee was buzzing around the, in the inside of the car where they were and so the father reached out and caught the bee in his hand and soon he opened his hand and the bee began to buzz and the little boy began to cry and to panic and the father reached over to the little boy and said relax son I took the sting and the bee can't hurt you anymore well I come by morning uh, to tell somebody that the empty tomb, uh, God is a way of saying, relax children, uh, I took the sting uh, out of death and, uh, and the, the death can't hurt you anymore. Let me make it plain to you. Paul said, death, uh, where is your sting? Uh, grave, where is your victory? Uh, the tomb was empty because Jesus was alive. Uh, he has risen uh, and the promise is that uh, because the tomb was empty, we can live to uh, the best is still yet to come uh, Jesus showed us uh, that the tomb was empty but you got to go uh, up uh, to go down to go down to then get up uh, before you can rise some stuff has got to die uh, and the empty tomb uh, reminds me uh, that I'm living this life uh, just uh, to live again uh, because without the empty tomb uh, there is no savior there is no salvation there is no hope. Nothing is for sure. But this one thing I do know that one of these old days, this robe of flesh, I'm gonna drop it and rise. I can shout about it today that the tomb was empty, even though they tried to seal it with a great big stone. Came no grave. Hold his body down. reminds me uh, even though my circumstances uh, may be tough uh, it's not over here there is something uh, the best is yet to come uh, I'm not worried about uh, what I go through down here because I am just uh, a stranger down here
This world is not my home. If you wonder why everything seems to be uncomfortable, it's because you don't belong down here. And you know where you belong. You can't sleep at night because that's not the bed you're supposed to sleep in. This world is not my home. And the empty tomb reminds me of that one glad morning when this The promise of the empty cross. The promise of the empty tomb. But tell somebody, there's one more empty promise. It doesn't end there. There's one more empty promise. Back to the text. Back to the text. Back to the text. After the angel had spoken to the women, they immediately went back to, to, the, to the disciples and reported what had happened. Yeah, because we do that, girls. We run back and tell stuff. Yeah. If you know, if you if you sure, uh, you, you know, you got those, those, those girlfriends of yours that you got to say, now, I'm going to tell you this, but don't tell nobody. <laughs> but don't, they, don't tell a sister, because she going to tell it. So they ran back, and, and, and with this incredible news, Peter and John immediately raced back to the tomb to see for themselves. And when they got there, John stopped just outside the tomb, but Peter ran right in. Uh, that's what the text said, y'all, right? It, it didn't take them long to discover uh, that the tomb was just the way uh, the women had said it was empty. See, they don't always believe us, y'all, but sometimes we do tell the truth. So they got there. Uh, the, the guys got there and said, oh, yeah, they're right. It is. It is empty. Uh, th th this could only mean one thing, uh, that Jesus was, in fact, alive. But, but, but you may not still believe that. If someone had stolen his body, they wouldn't have uh, removed the burial clothes and folded them neatly and left them where he lay. Uh, the, the third empty promise, uh, empty burial clothes. Uh, so I, 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 empty burial clothes. They, 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 they would not have, uh, if they would have stolen his body, they would have grabbed him up and, 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 and took him. They, they wouldn't have folded the clothes back up, right? Uh, grave clothes left in good condition yeah. prove that nobody stole his body. Truly, Jesus was resurrected. Christ had left the grave clothes, check this out y'all, behind him because he rose to die no more. Never to use these clothes again. If you don't believe me, Lazarus, come here Lazarus, Lazarus came out in his grave clothes. Lazarus came out in his grave clothes because he was going to use them again. But, but, but Jesus ain't had no need for, for, for grave clothes, so he left them. Jesus left the clothes for our use. Check this out, y'all. I read this. Jesus left the clothes for our use, uh, uh, for, uh, for, for us. Uh, if the grave be a bed for the saints, uh, thus he has sheeted the bed. In other words, Jesus left the clothes because he made the bed for you. So, so, so when you lie down and your face become a looking glass, you ain't got to be afraid of that because Jesus done made the bed up for you. And the sheets, uh, he's already, because when, when, when he left the grave clothes, he laid them out. So all you got to do is rest in Jesus' clothes. Uh, he made it. Now, I, I get pretty man when I come home from work and, and the bed ain't made up, the least you can do is make the bed up. Uh, uh, and Jesus was, was, was a good husband. Uh, he got up uh, and he made the bed. Uh, he, he, he left. Uh, 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 that's what the Bible says, that he, he, he left the clothes. Uh, but check this out. Uh, uh, the, the, the napkin was still folded. Tell somebody the napkin was still folded. I'm about to get out of here. The napkin was still folded separate from the grave clothes, y'all. The napkins were used to cover the face of the dead. Uh, uh, come here, Lazarus. Uh, when Lazarus stood up uh, in his grave clothes, uh, if you go to John 11 and 44, you'll find that Lazarus still had the napkin wrapped on his face. Uh, but I come by here this morning to tell you that there's no need to use a napkin uh, when a man is not dead. Uh, ain't no need to, to wrap no napkin on a living man. Uh, and so the Bible says uh, that the napkin was left uh, separate from the grave clothes. Yes, uh, put me in the clothes, uh, but don't cover my face. Uh, uh, don't cover my face because uh, cause I'm not dead. Uh, I'll put the clothes on, uh, but I'm not dead. Uh, the third promise uh, is empty. Uh, 
burial clothes. Uh, Matthew says that the napkin was probably left to wipe away our tears. And the napkin can be used when you look at the loved one that you lost. Remember, not only did Jesus make the bed, but he left the napkin to wipe your tears away. And Jesus gave them to know that it won't be long before I'll show up and you will see for yourself that I am still here. He God, I'm going to sit down with you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to talk with you. I'm going to eat with you. And once again, they will be able to have fellowship with the Lord. Yes, the promise of the burial, the burial clothes is that Jesus is alive and he will still have fellowship with us. Think about it. The cross couldn't hold him. The tomb couldn't contain him. The burial clothes were not necessary because Jesus is alive. I don't know about you, but it has been over 2,000 years since Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrection. The first resurrection Sunday, as the women went to the grave, they had no idea about what was going to happen to them. They were not aware of the wonderful promises of that day. Off in the distance stood an empty cross, the promise of sins forgiven. At the end of their journey, an empty tomb, the promise of eternal life inside the tomb, empty burial clothes, the promise that once again I'll have fellowship with him. The promise that we discovered today is that you can have freedom from your sins. You can live again and Jesus Christ is alive. He walks with me and my God talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. If he is alive, say yes. Say yes. I got one more little story about a man named John Maxwell. He tells the story about a blazer that he bought from Nordstrom's and after wearing it several times, he didn't want it anymore and he remembered what Nordstrom promised unconditionally. You can bring back whatever. It was a return policy. He said, well, I don't like this blazer but I've worn it three or four times and it's got lint all over it so I'm going to test this policy and so he showed up at Nordstrom's and he said, Mr. Salesman, I'm feeling a little nervous but I bought this blazer a long time ago. It's full of lint but I don't like it and it doesn't fit me well and it's worn a lot and so the salesman said, no problem Mr. Maxwell, let's go over to the men's department and see if we can't find you another blazer that looks like this one or anyone that you want. And so Mr. Maxwell stood there in amazement. He said, I can't believe this. I've worn this five or six times. It's got lit all over it. It's been almost a year. But then this man tells me that I can leave here with a new blazer. And not only that, he walked out with a blazer that cost $75 more and it did not cost him a penny. I come by this morning to tell you in a small way the Nordstrom department store is just like God. He is evil. And I'm 
specializes in filling emptiness. In creation, he flung the universe into an expanse of emptiness. He hung the stars upon nothing. He turned nothing into something and then hung it on nothing. My God!
is there to prove Savior Come on, let's all say it. Because he lived. Oh, I can face tomorrow. Because, because he lived. All fear, all fear. He lives. As the preachers walk down the aisle, maybe there's somebody here. We're going to open the doors of the church here in this building this morning. First reason we open the doors of the church in here, you're not saved and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's the first reason we open the doors of the church. The second reason is that you're already saved. You live in this community, in this vicinity, and you don't have a church home with the Holy Spirit. It's impressive upon you to come and join Silas First Baptist Church. The doors of the church home. Come on, come on this morning. What a great time to come to the join the church of Jesus Christ. Come on, the doors open. Oh Lord, and life is worth just be because he lives. Hey! 